Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode seven of On Air. Today, we have Nicholas Kahn and Richard Selesnik joining us for a reading of their book. But before we jump into that, I want to give uh, our community shout out to Lofty Coffee. They're providing a new service called Lofty Provisions. This is a home delivery service for their fresh roasted coffee, as well as many of their scratch made uh, from scratch made goods, carefully delivered to your doorstep. So follow the link that Victor is sharing with you if you're interested in ordering from them. Um, but now I would like to jump to today's episode. Khan and Slesnik are doing a reading from their book, A Hundred Views of a Drowning World actually also have it here. Uh, I love it personally. I have read only about half of the stories, but there is a hundred stories in 98 stories in there. I don't know. Richard Selesnik. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> I'm doing great today. <laughs> It's going great. Anyway, guys, uh, we have the book on sale in our store as well. So if you're interested in uh, purchasing it, visit our store. And at the end of the storytelling, we'll open up the question for questions for you guys. So if you have any questions about how the, these pictures were created, the stories behind them were created, uh, put them in the Q&A. We'll have four different stories today. Um, so now I would like to pass it on to Nicholas Gahn and Richard Selesnik. Hello. Um, yes, we'll be uh, reading four stories. Um, I guess the basic thing with these stories is that the two main characters are kind of um, sort of like uh, alter egos for ourselves. Uh, the names come from uh, the operetta Die, Die Fleide Maus, that was kind of a, a farce, um, a farcical operetta with these two characters called uh, Dr. Falka and Count Orlovsky. Uh, so we kind of took those uh, names and used them for our alter egos in these stories. And the stories are kind of narrated by Dr. Falka. Okay, and uh, so I'm gonna start with um, this image, which she'll show you on the screen. Um, Aris Kint at the Neue Museum. The Neue Museum is a museum um, on Fifth Avenue, Fifth Avenue in New York that has a, in it, the Cafe Fledermouse. So you'll, you'll kind of get that um, connection perhaps from that, but it recreates the, the time of uh, the Wiener Werkstatt um, in that particular beautiful room of this amazing museum in New York that we, Rich and I go to quite often and indulge in wonderful Viennese cakes there. And it's a, a spectacular room filled with uh, turn of the century, uh, beautiful uh, tables and things from the time of Egon Schiel and Gustav Klimt. And it's dreamy and that's all been a big influence on this project. And with the name Cafe Plato Mouse, it plays off the bat and the operetta, Strauss's operetta. So, and our stories are all about that. So. Ariskind at the Neue Museum. On the subject of my own malady, I think the first time I noticed something amiss was at Cafe Fledermas at the Neue Museum on Fifth Avenue. I never tired of coming to this recreation of those lost Werkstatt days, a time to which I always felt strongly drawn. On the walls, haunted faces stared out of resplendent secessionist portraits with wide insomniac eyes, make me wonder if the sitters somehow intuited the apocalypse that was about to engulf their world. On this occasion, I sat with my coffee, watching the waitstaff push trolleys of lint cakes and sacro torch through the elegantly paneled rooms, bustling as always. Through the high windows, the trees were bare in the park. Perhaps it was November or maybe March. At a certain point, I noticed a strange itchiness in my nose. I put my hand to my face to scratch it. As soon as I touched it, I felt an excruciating thrill of pain. That sensation, the discovery of a tickle in the throat, of an unnoticed lump on the neck, or a constriction in the head, something that previously seemed not to exist, when exposed suddenly, becomes the complete focus of our attention, and the world changes irrevocably. How had my throbbing beak escaped my notice? I tried to think back, but a thick, Heavy confusion had come over me, and I realized I could not recall where I had 
been prior to my arrival at the cafe. How had I gotten there? By taxi or on foot? And not just this, things seem to be recurring without regard to causality. I would leave my table and then I would be paying the bill, seeing a spilled glass of water, only to see my hand shoot out and knock it over, as if I was incapable of setting events in the correct order. The trolley of lint cakes and sakatorot would roll past again and again and again. If I could only remember how I had come to be here, I felt I might be able to somehow put the thread back together. Was I staying at a hotel? The Carlisle? A flop house on Hell's Kitchen? God only knew, but I could not remember, having slept in a long while, and my eyes were pustulant and sore. The insomnia, I thought, perhaps I had been awoke, awake for days or even weeks on end. I sneezed into my cake, rather too loudly, as people turned to stare, and, looking down, I was alarmed to see that I had covered both myself and the tablecloth with fine droplets of blood and chunks of a white encrustation that resembled crystallized snot. Furthermore, I now noticed that I was sporting a threadbare coat of mousy brown fur that appeared to be in the process of disintegrating. And of course, I felt cold, always so cold. On the walls, the twisted, emaciated figures looked down from the portraits, desperate, disconsolate, dark circles ringing their eyes, the gleaming trolley of cakes went past again, and this time I saw myself reflected in the silver bowls. The wretched figure I saw there was unrecognizable, and I wondered, had I become homeless? I knew that as the world slowly went raw. Refugees. I built cardboard sanctuaries in the tunnels that catacombed the subterranean depths of the city, months or perhaps even years passing without their once coming to the surface, an endless hibernation that was in marked contrast to being permanently awake, wandering the sleepless city like a tormented somnambulist. Bits of my fur were now coming off in tufts, floating around the cafe like dandelion seeds. Finally managing to stand up on my hind claws, I made for the exit, my huge, leathery wings dragging pitifully behind me, upturning dessert carts and trays, sending gorgeous platters of Schwarzwalder, Kefertorf, and Milkramstrudel scattering across the parapet. Was it a doctor I needed or a vet? This was the last thought that crossed my mind before consciousness dissolved into a terrible barrage of clicks, squeaks, and yelps. Then the room grew dark, and sleep, sweet sleep, mercifully descended upon me at last. Okay, um, this next story is called uh, Bat in a Tree. Um, both these stories are somewhat about um, people turning into bats, and people, as they turn into bats, are experiencing the illness of all the uh, the bats have been having up here, the white nose fungus. Okay, bat in a tree. I remember the first time we heard it. The peculiar thing was that I heard it with my nose. The first time I discovered that the human proboscis could also be an ear for subsonic noises. I was with Orlovsky somewhere on the gloomy island of Manhattan in the naked moraine of the central parklands. Lost, of course not because we didn't know where we were, but because that was Orlovsky's unalterable condition. Weather and water tended to congeal in this location, marshaled here by the slot canyons that stretched to the water in all directions. Some refer to this poisoned land as an oasis, but it never failed to fill me with anything other than revulsion and sadness. But it was curiously addictive, and if I didn't pay attention, I would frequently find my boots carrying me into these city, city forests, seemingly of their own volition. On this occasion, I heard an odd bubbling of waters, persistent and irritating, like an affliction of the inner ear, a coursing of snots through the membrane walls. And with this, I became prey to a terrible shivering insomnia. Concerned, Orlovsky suggested we curtail our stay in the city, and depart for the northern mountains, a brown, sparsely populated frontier 
where whiskered pioneers in bearskin coats tended homemade stills, the silence only broken by the occasional twang of rustic banjos at Creekside Hootenannies. I was now quite ill. The flood had engulfed my throbbing head, drowning my brain as the train sped up the riverside embankments. Even the river is drowned, Orlovsky had said. Eventually, the mountains appeared, dreary on the horizon. It was here that it started, he told me, the nose plague. First, just a bubbling in the nostrils, a watery droplet in the ears, ping, ping, a leaky roof, a damp cave, an incrustation of nasal stalactites dripping above unseeing, unsleeping eyes, row upon row of tiny gentlemen in fur coats and leather stockings, each carefully mounted on his own miniature ornithopter, spiraling down, down onto the slopes of a rising mountain a boulder-strewn guano, survivors slowly starving, rescue parties arriving too late. Where's the black box? There it is. What caused this disaster? It was pilot error. No, the changing arrangements of air currents in the upper atmosphere. The dang, dang, dang go the banjos. Hudson River bracketed, robber barons, twinkle, twinkle, little bat. Push Orlovsky away, hit him. A Beaux-Arts mansion, wooden shanties, then nobody, nothing. Beaver dreams, a rocky crevice, a sleep that isn't. It was misty and still when I finally managed to escape the cave. The density of the weather had suffocated all sounds other than the accretion of dew on the twisted pines that sporadically emerged from the field of enormous boulders, each freshly shorn from the crags that disappeared into the gray celestial realm above me. Even the air had become liquid or rather a more solid variety of liquid. And the sharp coolness of these congealed droplets seemed to act upon my fever dispellings. I climbed upward, ever upward, through the gigantic boulder gardens. And I thought all roads might lead to the eternal city, but once one passes through the gates, these roads cease to lead anywhere, lead nowhere in fact, to nothing. Emerging from the mist, I climbed a solitary pine and looked towards the distant metropolis, its first light just starting to twinkle on the horizon. Come back to me, come back to me, it whispered, a soft subliminal echolocation to nocturnal creatures everywhere. Loved it. And now, on the same location, in fact, where the last one was shot, this shot. It's called McGillicuddy Re McGillicuddy's Reeks. It's a place in Ireland. McGillicuddy's Reeks. I still remember the first time I laid eyes on the black sacks. I had slept some long time, very deep and dark, before waking up at a small bed and breakfast in Killarney. Much to my surprise, a perfectly conical cinder cone of gray gravel was visible from my room, the light playing on its summit and rendering its colorless moonscapes by turns purple, yellow, and sage green. I should perhaps have realized how seductive such mirages could be to the impressionable mind. At breakfast, served by the landlady, beautiful mountains, I remark. Oh, sir, don't be saying that. I, I perceived a coy delivery and got it a wrong impression. Why ever not, I inquired, a smirk on my features. Flustered. She told me a peculiar tale. Many years ago, a bell right by the name of O'Neill had ca cast a particularly perfect specimen at his makeshift boundary in Muckross. Enamored with his creation, he had run his hand admirably on the bell's lips. And much to his surprise, it had begun to resonate softly. Perhaps an hour went by with no dis dis diminishment of the sound. If anything, it was getting louder by the minute. O'Neill noticed a gnat hovering over the bell. He'd be damned if this wasn't the identical pest that had vexed him earlier that morning, the very same he murdered with his hammer when it had alighted on his anvil. His wife appeared at the door, the smithy cat, dead the previous day of distemper and left on the midden to rock, had been glimpsed down the lane by the neighbor. It was the bell, O'Neill realized. He had inadvertently created the instrument that would sound out the last judgment 
and raise the sinners from their graves. Horrified to think what the village priest might make of such blasphemy, he wrapped the bell in oil skins to silence it as best as he could, then took it into the mountains where he dumped it into a lock. It was said to be ringing still, drawing unwitting travelers to become enchanted and lost into the reeks. It was perhaps such enchantments that led me to purchase a donkey and a trap from a man named Dermid on the town's edge. Might not motorized transport suit you better, he had asked, dubious, or at least a bicycle. I replied that a stack of luggage such as my own would never yield to a bicycle, and besides, the donkey would make tolerable company. I planned to be away for a while. After loading up with hardtack and iodine tablets, I made for the Gap of Dunlo, thence ever more deeply into the mountains. The donkey would not travel by day, choosing instead to gorge on the sweet sedges of the bog. However, as soon as a golden hour set in, he would take to marching briskly up whatever rotted boreen his hoary nature pleased, pulling the trap right into the small hours of the morning. During these nocturnal rambles, he would sing. He had a fine voice and carried a tune better than many amateur baritones found in the licensed houses of Connaught, or at least I thought he did. In truth, I had become very unwell. Raw winds penetrated every orifice of the drafty cart, and I would pass the feverish nights shivering in my blanket, the bards of Aaron singing incessantly in my lump and aching head. The tinkers call this malady pudding ear. I remember that when I was a child, my brother had told me he heard celestial musics and voices while experiencing epileptic seizures. Now, in my sickly box, I could feel the dull drone of O'Neill's bell, a siren's call growing louder and louder until every last stone, puddle, and blade of grass in the reek's poisoned glens pleaded silently for the end of days. Okay, um, and the last one we'll be reading is called The Face. Um, this particular shot was taken in, uh, in Wellfleet on the uh, sand flats there. Um, okay, The Face. I was nowhere, a fugitive in the mind of God. I escaped with the others and we swam ashore as best we could as the stars above us shattered and fell into the sea. On the beach, a man was selling faces. It was hard to ascertain whether this was the beginning or the end or both, but we had spent an eternity waiting for this moment. So we accepted the stringency of his terms, walked upwards towards the rocks and boarded the train that waited for us there. As we pulled away from the halt, I allowed myself to glance up at the other passengers. They had already been captured by the world, men and women from all walks of life with families, household appliances and bank accounts, ordinary people who had coalesced into themselves like the hard stubbly stalks of harvested corn in the winter fields beyond the outskirts of the city. The dark felts of the men's fedoras were so soft it made them look alive as if they had been enticed to fly onto the men's heads and roost there like a parliament of rooks. Outside the window, something was passing, illuminated indistinctly by occasional flashes of distant light, perhaps from the perpetual wars that always seemed to be raging just beyond the horizon. But then again, perhaps not, for are such conflicts still necessary when the planets have collided and the gods have been knocked down from their perches on high and fallen to earth, their wings of flame. A man walked along the aisle and sat next to me. He told me he had been a magician before these times of disarray. This will seem counterintuitive, he said, but when you arrive at the terminal, make sure your entire being is contained within your face. You must resist the urge to withdraw deep within your being. This will only lead you into the abyss and they will know this. It is easy to murder someone who is already a corpse. He closed his eyes for a moment, and when he opened them, he drew my hand up to his cheek and gently pulled the tips of my fingers across the velvety skin of his face. 
A life unfurled before me. A woman by a stove. Applause in a darkened room. Rain on the cobblestones. I don't know if this life belonged to him or whether it was an illusion. But regardless, these memories were transferred into my own face until I could smell the burnt loaves in, loaves in my nose, hear the percussive sound of clapping in my ears, feel the melancholy elation of being lost in an unfamiliar city on a rainy evening. I opened my eyes and looked at the magician. His head had slumped into his chest, his face no more than a threepenny disguise, as ashen and exhausted as all the rest of us. Anonymous squat buildings started to appear amidst the rubble, and soon we had arrived at our destination, although in the half-light, I couldn't tell if this was a railway terminus, a theater, a prison, a workhouse, or perhaps a combination of all these things. We were greeted by entities that may once have been men, but now who more properly resembled a hydra. The luscious felt fedoras were removed from our heads and put in a pile, along with our luggage, which was labeled and cataloged in triplicate. I was shuttled to a desk. Behind it was a dead man with no face. Incongruously, he wore spectacles. The dead man said nothing. What could he say? He had no mouth. So I took his hand and gently pulled his fingertips across my cheek until gradually a face formed on his own blank head. And he too saw the woman at the stove, heard the applause in the darkened room, felt the rain on the cobblestones beneath his feet. Soon tears were streaming from his eyes, and with his newly formed mouth, he was able to grunt and gesture towards a large arched entranceway opposite the holding pens. That way, he said, I retrieved my suitcase and exited the terminus into the ravaged city beyond. Uh, thank you. So yeah, thank you so much for those stories. It's really, you know, I kind of wished we had a an audiobook version of your story that because of hearing you read it just gives a whole nother element to it. This, I mean, to hear the artist's voice within it. I personally really loved it. So I'm really curious. Um, also, I want to open up questions to everybody else, but I'll start off with some questions. Mm. So um, these stories, they came after the images were made, correct? Um, sometimes, um, other on other occasions, uh, the story would come first and then we'd take an image to, to match it, but mostly they came after. Yeah, so I'm curious, did the story kind of develop very naturally from you and then the images found the photographs or did the photographs come when you were writing, did you base the writing on the photograph? I'd, I'd say it kind of, it all came around at the same time because when me and Nicholas uh, started the project, we actually didn't necessarily know what the project as a whole was about. And so the entire process of the project over the five years and doing the posters, the book, the text, uh, the sculptures, all of it kind of, um, all of it developed uh, together. So it was almost like, uh, it was all, almost like an uncovering a mystery to us and gradually yeah. out the connections between all the different things. We, uh, it, it sort of revealed itself to us, the, the, novel kind of wrote itself. We would see images laying down on our little sort of Freudian couches and go into uh, these kind of semi-conscious states and things would get revealed and an image would be shot from and then a, uh, that often would come from a drawing that we might make from those kind of half dream states and then it also would suggest a story. I might mention a story concept or give Richard a bit of research, and then he would go into his space and out would form these stories that were completely amazing to me. And it was it just kept revealing episode after episode. We also had from a kind of a previous project uh, that we'd, we'd actually thought about doing um, a novel told only in pictures. And we had kind of uh, produced um, reams and reams of little, little thumbnail sketches for images. And so once this project started, we started drawing on this kind of image bank that we'd already made. And because of that, 
because this story had already been worked out but didn't actually end up being this story, the images were all related in this kind of theme and variation kind of way, which is oftentimes how we work more than traditional narrative. You can see that in the, um, the drawings Nicholas is doing. It's, all, it's very much about theme and variation. Mm -hmm. Right. So actually, uh, I feel like this is kind of a follow up question. Uh, Claudia is asking, uh, have you thought of making a film? We think about film, um, but my dad was a cameraman um, and my grandfather worked in Hollywood. Um, and so I know the, the kind of immense difficulty of doing a, a proper film. We have done um, short videos while we were making many of these and we're collecting those together. We need to edit them. They're maybe 10 seconds, 30 seconds each. And we have a listening and watching device that is based on the costume of the magician in our tarot deck, who has a head that's like a little miniature uh, cinema with tubes coming out of it. And they are like telescopes coming out at strange angles from the bo box and then rest is his magician's costume. Um, and we want people to be able to go up to that same box on tripod legs in a gallery and uh, the various videos that we did shoot while making this, you would look in different tubes and you would see these little clips and it would show you all these worlds that you've been seeing in the book uh, on the walls of an exhibition that they really happened and these, these places are real. When you see moving characters going through it, um, even if it's just for a few seconds, you realize this, this isn't fiction, this all absolutely happened. I think also we kind of like, um, we often feel like we're kind of, we're making a film except without the film. Because we make all the props, uh, we have the script, we have the storyboards, we have the still pictures. It's, so yeah, it feels like filmmaking even if the end result isn't a film. And film's also been a, probably one of the biggest influences on us in general. Uh, we look at a lot of film. I love that, how you're creating a whole um, array of different materials that, you know, people ne don't necessarily get to see the products of in such direct ways, like the posters, like the performances that you do, you know, people don't witness that besides the kind of the afterwards uh, paraphernalia that you leave behind. I think that's uh, such a great part of your practice. Um, we have another comment from Sean here. I would love to see a photo novella or a graphic novel utilizing your photos and paintings. Yeah, yeah again, something we've, uh, we've talked a lot about. Um, we've looked a lot at the wordless novels of an uh, artist from the 20s called uh, Lind Ward. He, was, um, he did mostly woodcuts, um, often on kind of like uh, somewhat kind of social kind of themes um, and so the book would be like you know usually 100 to 150 images that told a, a story without words and so they were kind of almost like a precursor to a lot of kind of graphic novels and we've talked for years about wanting to do something like that. It's uh, the the tarot deck is in that direction but w so there's many thoughts about doing a, a graphic one that's all drawn or doing one with photos that we and we've done many many um little drawings towards that and i think that was one of the precursors for this project the little sketches that we had done that we then managed to turn into photos that became the this uh, troop of plato mouse wonderful um i also want to let everybody know that we are going to have a talk with uh, Gordon Statinius, uh, if I, I'm sorry, Gordon, if I don't say your last name right. Um, he uh, collaborated with uh, Nicholas and Richard on this book, uh, uh, published it through Canada Books. And we'll be diving more into the publication of this, which is absolutely wonderful. The fact that you get to move around these pages, create your own stories, your own narratives, and ties in with your or your play and your ambiguity with time. Um, so what 
what was the reason for you to decide it to bond it like that or bonded unbounded i think there were a couple of things one of the things we really liked the idea was that it would be uh the book would almost be like an exhibition in a box like it would be a portable exhibition um because as artists kind of showing in galleries you can come into issues with the with framing costs and all kinds of things like that and shipping trying to ship huge things around so we like the idea that you could have this thing that would be like an entire show uh just in a small box that could go anywhere really easily and cover a huge amount of space but but be really compact so the idea was to squeeze as much content uh in a way as we could into into this kind of funny format also um the shuffleable nature we we were in a postmodernism in literature class way back in college when we were first meeting and doing our first collaborations and there was talk of and we looked at some shuffleable novels as a concept and there's been two or three of them uh out there but we hadn't seen a shuffleable novel that also was images. We we liked Zabold, uh, the German writer who's often used photos and mix of fiction and and, uh, and nonfiction in some of his novels. So that combination of images and writing to create a novel intrigued us. But then matching that with this really peculiar format of a shuffleable novel, where the chance ordering of the pages might affect the narrative, but it can be written in such a way that you experience it differently, different people do, but it's still that accumulation of these memories of these moments and you piece it all together in, from, from this kind of disturbed uh, memory of the, these events happening and it would echo the something of the kind of mad rush that the bat may feel as his nightmares and daydreams are combining when he's in a cave upset over the course of uh, uh, a long winter with white nose fungus. So it, it echoed the, the the form and format, echoed this kind of derangement that we wanted to talk about that was the state of being in a strange plague, which we are all experiencing right now. So welcome to our world, everyone. Yeah, and speaking of things not being linear at all anymore, most of the time, I don't even know what day it is. So. Yes, definitely. Um, we have another question from uh, John. What is the map and color arrow? What are the map and color arrows about? And he's also thanking you for the presentation. Yeah, the we kind of liked the idea because we were because um, it was all going to be loose pages. We still wanted some kind of uh, structure to it, and I think because a lot of it's based on places that. Um, me and Nicholas have spent a lot of time doing work. We kind of had, we divided it up into different kind of geographical areas. Um, so we had stuff on the Cape, uh, stuff uh, in the kind of Hudson Valley, New York City area. Um, we had some set in the English County of Somerset, some in Ireland and so forth. So the idea was that uh, we'd use the map and the color coding so that there'd be some kind of like structure uh, uh, to the whole thing. And, and so we get a kind of a geographical kind of structure, basically. And, and the, the look of it, we modeled a bit on both of us spending a lot of our use in London uh, on the underground map and the magic of checking and like staring at those maps and wondering where that train route or that that underground path would go and so we color coded them in just the same way and used a similar quality of the the kind of magic the 1930s future that the underground represented uh, to us the sort of nostalgia for a for a past future yeah also there's like a i forget the name of the artist but uh the uh, a particular uh, british artist took the underground map and he changed all the names on it. Like he used it to kind of classify different things like the names of philosophers or famous uh, uh, soccer players. So the idea of using a map and then putting your own kind of mythology, plugging it into the map, is kind of like intriguing uh, thing for us to do. Yeah, I think map, may, map making itself is already just 
such a fascinating topic that I'm sure we could talk about a lot more. <laughs> um, more, but, more Adams will be doing that, will he not? Yes, yes. Yeah. So for um, our, our talk with Mark Adams, will, it will be about um, mapping territories and um, kind of the relationship between art and science and how that conversation uh, concerning map making and um, mapping geographies, uh, how those are related and how you use that yourself in your work which will be really exciting. So I want to thank you both so much for um, sharing these stories today. It was really wonderful to hear them coming from you. Um, thank you so much, everybody else, for joining. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. This has yeah. been fun. Bye. Bye.